Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. Um, my name is Adam Crichton. I'm a research fellow here, and I'll be in seeing the evening uh, tonight. We uh, have the pleasure to present you uh, with Mr. Lindsay Tanner, who obviously precedes himself. He was a member for Melbourne from 1993 to 2010, and of course the Finance Minister in the Rudd Government from uh, 2007 to the election last year. Uh, this year he's published a book uh, called Sideshow, which no doubt many of you have heard for, uh, from. Rather, It takes a very critical view of the quality of democratic debate in this country, um, and it's been widely reviewed in Australia and all the major publications. I must say some of the reviews have been very critical, but that's probably because they've been reviewed by journalists, and to some extent journalists are the target of uh, Mr Tanner's uh, book. So the procedure for this evening will be that Mr Tanner will speak for 20 minutes, and then there'll be a question and answer session for 20 minutes, uh, and then he'll be willing to sign copies of his book, which are for sale just here in the foyer. Uh, we have a representative from, I think, The Constant Reader, which is a local bookstore, uh, and Sophia Kirby is here to sell books. I should also add that it's, it's, um, tonight's proceedings are being filmed, so, so your questions will all be recorded. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mr Tanner. Yes, so unfortunately that means we all have to behave ourselves. Uh, uh, it's been very liberating no longer being a politician. I can literally say whatever I like and not have to worry about what the Prime Minister's office is going to say or do to me shortly thereafter. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you and apologies to those who originally were expecting this to be June the 22nd. Unfortunately, a Chilean volcano got in the way and uh, so this is somewhat belated. I will very quickly give you a, an outline of the thrust of the argument in my book and I start by saying this is by no means the whole picture. It is part of a wider picture, I think, that's quite distressing about the state of Australian politics and also political discourse in many other parts of the world. But I think it's a really important bit that thus far people haven't really focused on. I have no doubt I don't need to explain to you some of the very depressing elements of Australian politics at the moment. Spin, robotic politicians using scripts, avoiding questions, doing silly stunts, childish gimmicks, all of these kinds of things, they are a given in my view. Even the most uh, recent development uh, encapsulated in that new noun, the announceable, which uh, I was interested to see Mark Latham hadn't heard of the other day in one of his columns. The, the announceable is of course something which has merit from one dimension only and that is to get a positive page three story in the Daily Telegraph or run on the commercial TV news. It is in fact an extremely expensive taxpayer financed advertisement which may indeed involve spending money on something but typically it is a tokenistic effort which is designed to look like the government is doing something about a problem not actually doing something. So we're all very conscious and aware of these problems. What I've tried to do in this book is actually ask well why are these things happening? Why now? Why has it come to this? And my central answer is that essentially politicians by and large are reacting to a changing media context. And in some respects we've ended up, me and some of the journalists that I've been debating with in this kind of uh, pointless argument about who's more to blame. Well the answer is we're all to blame and politicians, yes, they carry a serious responsibility for these things, but they're not the only ones. And the media are central because without the media, politicians do not exist. They have no prospect of political success without being able to communicate not just their views and what they stand for, but who they are, their name, to a wider population. And that therefore means that the media set the terms. They don't set them totally unilaterally. There is obviously an implicit, ongoing, endless negotiation where politicians make choices all the time, but by and large, if you want to be politically successful, you have to dance to that tune. That therefore means that if the media essentially say, if you want to get coverage, put on a silly hat, I put on a silly hat. Because if the alternative is failure, then there is no choice. And that's a simplistic way of describing it, but nonetheless, that is the reality. And whatever you do, don't fall for this nonsense that we're just the messenger, don't shoot the messenger. Because the media decide what the content of the message is. And the problem nowadays is that more and more that decision is being driven by entertainment values and by an implicit 
assumption that politics and reporting politics is really about entertaining and titillating people, not about conveying information and ensuring that people can understand what is happening in the wider political system. There's always been theatre in politics, there's always been trivia, there's always been nonsense, and up to a point it can play a useful role of lightening things up a bit, of making it a bit more accessible, a bit more interesting. The trouble is that that stuff has taken over. And so now what you've got is a combination of trivia and nonsense and celebrity rubbish and personalising things on the one hand, and on the other hand, ever more grotesque distortion of stories and of content to make them fit into an entertainment frame, to make them interesting and to make them uh, either uh, titillating or inspiring anger or creating some emotion in the person who's reading, watching or listening that makes them want to keep buying the newspaper or watching the TV or, ra or listening to the radio. So more and more those underlying commercial dynamics are driving distortion. But having started by saying, look, don't blame the politicians or don't blame them solely, then the same logic applies to the media. I used to be quite angry about these things as a politician. It used to drive me nuts because I considered myself somebody who was interested in serious things. And I found myself in a world where I literally had to do a song and dance routine to get attention to actually be a player. And one night at a function, I was sitting next to John Westacott from Channel 9. And I was berating him about a current affair and why it was no longer dealing with serious content and had turned into a bit of a freak show with the standard six templates for stories. You've no doubt seen them. The miracle cure for cancer, the tenant from hell, the bureaucrat from the local council who's heartless and vicious and so forth. And his answer floored me. His answer was, every time we have a politician on a current affair, 100,000 people change the channel. And I kind of went, ah, uh, er, um, right. And of course, they're a commercial business. They're in the business of selling advertising, of getting people watching their TV network. And by definition, they are going to respond to consumer demand. They have a highly tuned machine that's designed to do that. So nobody's to blame. There are no bad guys. Everybody carries a bit of responsibility for these set of problems. It's really being driven by a combination of circumstances, technological change, which has put ever more intensifying pressure on media outlets the traditional media, and at the same time you're getting a fragmentation, which means that in many cases you're getting better media, better quality media, in niche locations. And that's really good for people like me, who are highly educated, politically aware, follow issues closely. But what I think we are starting to lose is a kind of wide, broad public conversation with admittedly varying degrees of intensity, but where there is a common kind of understanding, a common language, a common discourse across the bulk of the community about national politics. That fragmentation and the intensification of entertainment in the mass audience and the gradual leaching away of seriousness and content into the niche audiences ultimately I think is undermining democracy in this country. Now, I just want to give a few highlight examples just to illustrate the point, and there are many examples of these things in my book, uh, all of them, of course, debatable, but the examples are these. First, the wake, in the wake of the Queensland floods, huge media discussion about Anna Bly cried and Julia Gillard didn't cry. Now, just stop for a minute and think, well, actually, what does that matter? What I would like to know if I were a Queenslander or if I were a flood victim, believe me or not, I have been a flood victim as a teenager many, many years ago. What I'd like to know is what's the government going to do about helping me? What's the government going to do about reviving the Queensland economy? I don't really care who cries or who doesn't cry. Yet, if you read our media, watched our media, that was the big issue. Front page of the Herald Sun in Melbourne, so forth. Second example, slightly closer to home. Early last year, you might recall Barnaby Joyce was Shadow Finance Minister for a short time. He was one of five Shadow Finance Ministers that I had against me in my time as Finance Minister. I'm claiming, I'm waiting for somebody to dispute this, I'm claiming an Australian record. I think I'm the only senior minister to have had five Shadow Finance Ministers, or Shadow Ministers in one parliament. There may be other examples, I can't think of them. We were recording Q&A, and in the green room before 
the recording, my media advisor was chatting to a journalist who was doing a big profile of Barnaby for the Good Weekend, the supplement to The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald on the weekend. And this journalist was asking my media advisor, you know, he got any good stories, any good gossip? And she you know, probably said one or two things, and I, I didn't find out about this conversation until some time after, by the way, but she then said, oh, why don't you do a profile of Lindsay? And straight away the response was, Lindsay's too normal. Um, now, as you can probably guess, I had mixed emotions when this was t recounted to me subsequently. As I kind of think, well, this could be a compliment, it could be an insult, I'm not quite sure. Fortunately, by that stage, I already had in the back of my mind the prospect of the parting, so my desperate efforts to get publicity were sort of diminishing somewhat, and I didn't really care that much. But it tells you everything you need to know. What it says is, if you want to succeed in modern Australian politics, put on a freak show. Because that what's get, that's what gets coverage, that's what gets attention, that's what gets name recognition, and ultimately without those things, you're dead. Put on a freak show. The third example I want to mention, which is somewhat more serious and distressing, is uh, about my good friend and colleague, Senator Nick Sherry, who was Assistant Treasurer. And early last year, from memory, uh, or middle of last year maybe, there was a big shock horror article in the business section of The Age, and I suspect in The Herald as well, saying, Labor Minister dined with Macquarie Bank just before bank guarantee decisions made by government. And the whole tone of this article, Nick Sherry had been to dinner with a few Macquarie Bank executives a week before the bank guarantee decisions. The whole tone of this article was corruption, abuse of power, you know, free kicks from Macquarie Bank, they benefited from the bank guarantees, etc. A few inconvenient facts were left out of the story. Number one, Nick Sherry was not a member of Cabinet. Number two, he found out about the decision to impose the bank guarantees about the same time all of you did namely when it was announced by Kevin Rudd because it was a decision made by four people of whom he was not one. Number three, senior government ministers, economic ministers having lunches, dinners with major interest parties, uh, companies, whatever, is a routine part of government and therefore there's nothing particularly sinister in him having dinner with a few people from Macquarie Bank. It is a standard practice. Yet from these entirely innocent facts, you have an article conjured up, which of course is designed to fill space, sell newspapers, make people feel like they're, they're getting some interesting, exciting information. And from those things you get conjured up something which carries a very powerful and very ugly slur against somebody who I regard as being of complete integrity and a very serious and honourable and decent politician, all in the name of selling a few newspapers. Now, there are many other examples uh, in order to keep the, the length of my comments down to a reasonable time, I won't go further than that. But these are just a few of the illustrations. And what's driving them is not necessarily any specific political agendas, any desire to favour this party or that party. Those things are still lurking around there a bit in various ways. But what's driving them is basically naked commercial interests which are under much more pressure than they used to be. And more and more we're getting a pattern that you can see in other countries like the UK of media outlets taking the prejudices of their core customers and reflecting them back to them. So you get this pattern where the media outlet starts with a set of standard templates like uh, teenage thugs, brackets, probably from an ethnic minority, close brackets, beat up good, honest, God-fearing, hard-working people in western suburbs of Sydney, brackets, probably people who read our newspaper, close brackets. Isn't it appalling? And that's the template. And the journalists, in effect, are instructed to go out and find some facts that vaguely, remotely, possibly, if they're beaten to death, might conceivably fit into that template and bang, you've got a story. That is how a lot of modern journalism now works. Politicians' perks is a classic an old time, old time classic of this genre in the political domain, but there are plenty of others. It's always been there, but more and more this kind of reporting is taking over, and it's driven by straight commercial factors. The media reaction to my book's been quite illuminating, and to be fair, it's been mixed, and there have been some serious senior journalists who clearly get it, and although they don't necessarily agree with everything I've said, have kind of said, well, look, there's a serious thing going on here, we need to discuss it. 
Uh, I've had some interesting commentary that has been less favourable. One of the things that amuses me about it is the variety of the commentary about me. So the commentary has included my appearance. No laughter, thank you very much. The school I attended, uh, how good or bad I was as finance minister, uh, what I am doing in my life after politics, uh, why I retired, and none of these things have got anything to do with the merit of my argument. It is a standard default positioning to immediately go for the personal, immediately to kind of attack the person involved or to, to default to their characteristics or some element of them rather than to actually deal with the content of the issue. And that in, it, in itself tells you a lot about what is happening. The very first coverage of my book was in the Murdoch Sunday tabloids by Samantha Maiden. These articles with headlines like Tanner Savages Rudd the Comma Gillard, Tanner Attacks Colleagues and all this kind of stuff. And amusingly enough, I actually predicted in the introduction of the book that that's precisely what would happen. So this is almost according to script. And of course, what's happened is that Sam Maiden has gone through the book very quickly, I, I suspect not actually read it, and has found key phrases like Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard and gone, aha, and tiny isolated references which are effectively there to criticise the media, then surgically extracted, turned on their head, wrapped in a different wrapping, and now presented as, well, this is an attack on former colleagues. But of course, Tanner Attacks Media is not really much of a Sunday newspaper story. Tanner Attacks Rudd, Tanner Attacks Gillard, well, yeah, that's kind of a Sunday newspaper story. So if the facts don't suit the story, well, you turn them on their head, make them say the opposite of what they're intended to say so that you've got a story. Then, of course, just to confuse me, I had former Liberal staffers Chris Kenny and Peter Van Onselen in The Australian criticising me for not attacking Kevin Rudd and Julie Gillard. Uh, and that, yeah, all this stuff about the media is all very well and good, but nobody's really interested in that. Why didn't you spill the beans? Why didn't you tell us what really happened in the, in the government? I had David Penberthy writing a review in The Australian saying that, in fact, the media weren't the problem. I was the problem. My problem was that I lacked a sense of fun. You know, and that, what do you mean? Of course politics is there to laugh about and be silly about, you know? That, it was almost as if the idea that it might be a serious process that decides the future of the country kind of hadn't occurred to him, you know, and so that I was basically being boring and fuddy-duddy-ish and so forth, and that, uh, in effect, I was uh, 50 going on 75. Now, as soon as I looked at this, I thought, mm, I hope to God Rupert Murdoch's not reading this because this guy might be in a bit of trouble. And the implicit sort of slight on Rupert's uh, sense of fun, I, I think he may not uh, take kindly to. But there was... To conclude on this sort of reference to the commentary in the media, there was uh, a slightly more sinister example in both the Penberthy article and in the Sam Maiden article that I think also illustrated the point. And that is the use of the term or, t or equivalent terms to lying. One of the examples I cited of how the media kind of takes the eye off the ball and focuses on the flim flam of announcements of carefully crafted announcements by politicians and then pays no attention to what, whether or not anything happens, was a business advisory council that Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan announced in early to mid-2007 in opposition. For one reason or another, it ultimately didn't eventuate. For no particularly sinister reasons, I think it just got all a bit too hard and things moved on, but it didn't happen. This is described by Penberthy in his review of my book as the government and Kevin Rudd having lied. Uh, it is described by Sam Maiden in her article as Kevin Rudd's deception. So in other words, what they're saying is that at the time this was announced, Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan knew that they weren't going to do it, that they were deliberately lying to people, they were saying uh, that they were pretending they were being dishonest. Now, of course, that is not the case and there's no evidence of that. In fact, it was much more mundane, messy, seemed like a good idea at the time, turned into a lot harder, think the world moved on, just ended up not happening. Uh, yet, this is routinely characterised as lying. Now, to me, ultimately, that devalues language. That devalues the seriousness of lying. If every time somebody says something and what they say ends up not being correct because, for example, they change their mind, if that's characterised as a lie, every time that happens, then you devalue the concept of lying. Now, finally, to 
probably take this into slightly more robust territory. All these things help us to understand why it is so hard to be a serious reformer in politics in Australia, but also in many other parts of the world, because the equation is all pointed in different directions. As we know, typically with serious reforms, pain is concentrated, benefits are diffuse, and the beneficiaries often don't even know that they're benefiting. So the people who are losing out, they will be pretty angry, pretty upset, pretty vocal, pretty volatile. The media inevitably magnify the pain of the losers. So they will switch seamlessly from attacking governments for not reforming things to attacking them for reforming things without missing a beat. Because ultimately, it's all got to be a story. The incentives are asymmetric. Essentially, the equation works like this. You want to be a serious reformer? What you do is you make all these tough decisions, cop a lot of pain, probably risk your political career, and some, somebody else gets the benefit in 10 years' time. That's effectively the underlying equation, so it's hardly surprising that a lot of politicians say, well, mm, maybe I'll put this back in the in-tray for the next person. We have, I think, an extreme form of complacency abroad in the Australian community at the moment. Uh, I, I think the it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality is rampant. That reflects 20 years of no serious recessions, which is obviously a fantastic thing, but nonetheless, Australia tends to be prone to complacency. We have the inertia of three tiers of government, and I was at the pointy end of this with the seamless national economy reform process where there were no villains, there were no bad guys, just an incredibly complex process where these things typically weren't the number one priority for a whole lot of the players, and so it was literally wading through treacle, continually wading, and it really requires focus and effort and political will to keep it going, and your enemy is inertia. It is not there are all these evil characters around the bureaucracy or the political world. Your enemy is inertia. But the final and most salient problem is that we now inhabit a world where appearances trump substance more than ever before. Appearances have always been pretty important, I can see, but they now trump substance completely. So I believe that there are now two critical rules for being a politician in Australia. Rule number one, look like you're doing something. It's typically preferable to avoid actually doing something because that may entail risk, but looking like you're doing something is critical. Rule number two, don't offend anyone who matters. So try and be all things to all people, pretend to everybody across the, the landscape that you're actually on their side and dance around the minefield and hope to goodness that they never catch up with you. These are the dynamics that now prevail. And that is the context of this kind of death embrace or downward embrace of politicians and media where we are further and further descending into a world where literally we face the risk that future national elections will be decided around such critical issues as what Tony Abbott looks like in Speedos or whether Julia Gillard cried after a national disaster or not. That is kind of where we're heading. Now, I think the big swing factor, the big uh, unknowable, is where the new media are going to take us. I wax and wane between optimism and pessimism here because obviously there's a lot of fantastic things happening, but it's early days. And at the moment, where we're at is new media that, in a sense, become an intensification of niches, of groups of people who, for example, in this context, are already the converted and that what is happening is that the wider conversation across the bulk of the community is starting to drain away. And that conversation is obviously critical to a functioning democracy. You can end up with the forms of democracy, but if you don't have the underlying substance, which a, an independent, reasonably serious media that is accessible and accessed by a pretty substantial majority of the population at varying levels, if you don't have those things, you don't have a real democracy. We're a way off that threat being realised, but that's the direction we're heading in. That's the thing I think we need to take stock of. That's the thing I think we all have a tiny bit of responsibility, some more than others, to try and push back against. Thank you very much.